Hi, everyone, and welcome to our usual Sunday talk within the nine sided circle at our usual time, 630 on Sunday evenings every week. I'm one of your two hosts, Nora Kyle. And I'm the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali. And first of all, we want to thank you for joining us. We have some of our favorite people here, and I'm sure we have some of our favorite people watching on the replay, as long as plenty of newcomers who will eventually, potentially, be some of our favorite people as well. So welcome. And uh, yeah, so we do need to do a little bit of our YouTube spiel, so please be patient with us while we do that. Is that my cue? Go ahead. Ah, <sighs> sigh. <laughs> All right, folks, we would really, really like it if you subscribe to our channel. It would help us greatly. We would be ever so appreciative. We would remember you to God if you subscribe to our channel. And along with subscribing, if you like this video, and if you went through and liked all of our other 150 videos that we've done as well, that would also be great because the uh, esoteric arcane uh, YouTube algorithm seems to like it when people like your videos. So we would like to get up into the things. There's many reasons that we would like you to subscribe, but mostly because if you're watching our videos, you got to be pretty cool. So we want to get to know you. So subscribe to our video. There you go. There you go. That was short and sweet-ish. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to try and keep this one uh, from going over. I mean, we're so good at going over on these talks. So I've got so we're gonna do our best yet. one hour or less. Sounds good. I like Take that. Take it away, Noor. All right. So today we have an interesting topic revolving around the word healing. But we want to, you know, kind of refocus that in. And think of it from the perspective of the spiritual marketplace, let's say. And, you know, inevitably, Sufism does tend to sort of fall into that realm. And, Some branches uh, of it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think this is a word that a lot of us can get mixed messages around. It can be a very confusing thing to talk about what it means to seek healing, to be healed. Is that an ongoing practice? Is that something that you do as like a one and done, it's over with, you never address those issues ever again. And we're going to be exploring that. Yeah. What did we title this topic, this talk, which talk? Uh, what did we title this talk? <laughs> it is, um, I'll pull it up. What happens when you've been healed? Sufism and the marketplace of spiritual healing. Spiritual healing, yes. Spiritual healing. Spiritual. Glory yes. Glory to Jesus, we all be healed. Yeehaw. And as some of you may know, we love to differentiate between what we talk about as remedial work and generative work. And in the context of what we're speaking about tonight, remedial work often involves the work of unpacking your past, unpacking your hangups that hold you back in the now, that prevent you from looking forward, perhaps. And they tend to be very sticky. They tend to stay with you. We talked about samskara last weekend. That's a bit of what we're discussing. And yeah, Mushtaq? Yeah, uh, I remember years and years ago, back in the dark ages, uh, when I was a kid in college, my philosophy professor saying to me one day, you know, most human beings are not psychologically broken. They are merely philosophically ignorant. And if you try and treat them as if they're broken, it is not going to serve them. So it's the difference between 
fixing something that's broken or educating someone who doesn't have all the knowledge they need. Mm -hmm. Those yes. are two really, really different things. Yeah. And we've noticed that sometimes people get a little bit hazy on that. I mean, we will see a lot of marketing out there that is targeting people who have pain points or traumas that they are struggling to work through. And it's challenging because sometimes these systems really highlight, they put an emphasis on this need for healing, this need to find pain and resolve it. But sometimes it's a, it's a long-term ongoing thing where it becomes a cyclical pattern of, you know, getting lost in this concept of healing itself. Yeah, if you need healing, then you are sick, right? Only sick people need to be healed. And just because you have had a trauma in your life does not necessarily mean that you're sick. I mean, are there people who really need to work on their trauma stuff? Hell yes, they absolutely do. And they need really good therapists to do that. Is that everyone? No. Is that the people who listen to us? No, not for the most part. I mean, yes, we've all had traumas. Surprisingly, most people manage to deal with their traumas and, and, and to do it in a way that they're not broken. And so our, our big point tonight is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this is not the same as gaslighting, is it? No. So how might we differentiate between those two things? Um, so somebody has a real trauma and uh, they have done work on it in their life and they are functioning quite well. And yes, they can remember the trauma. If they think about it hard enough, there might be a little residual pain. But by and large, they are working just fine in the world. And it is no longer a matter of, oh, I must heal from this trauma. I'm walking wounded, any of this stuff. It's a matter of, uh, I need to learn how to fit this into my life now. So is it more of an integration then? Yeah, it's more of an integration. And again, this is not to say that there, that there isn't a real need because life is traumatic, right? We all get bashed about. And some people get bashed about a lot. And those are the people who definitely need to do some healing. But the healing has to be terminal. It has to end somewhere. You have to be healed at some point. You can't just spend the rest of your life working on healing yourself. If, you, if you're doing that, then there's something wrong with the techniques that you're using. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's, there's, there is more talk about Sufi healing now. Um, there are a couple of aspects to Sufi healing. One is the physical. My teacher was really good at doing physical healing on people. It used to amaze me the results that he would get. Don't know how, but he got them really, really well. Um, I never had that particular calling. I am more interested in the minds and hearts and souls of people. And that's, that's where I tend to work. Um, and that's another aspect of Sufi healing. There, there are Sufi healers that work with the traumas that you, uh, you might be carrying around with you, with, with the psychic injuries. 
there are not that many of them that are actually Sufi healers, but there's a few. Um, at least that I know of. But if the ones that I know, if you keep coming back to them, uh, going, oh, I need more healing, they're going to get pissed off at you. It's like, what? We healed this. Did you make yourself sick again? Why you do that? Why you make yourself sick? And that's a really important question. Because if you have been healed and you still have the trauma, you have to ask yourself, did I make, did I re-sicken myself? And that's where maybe a good therapist would be really handy to ask you those questions. Why can't you let this go? So healing then, is it like a res revel resolution, would you say? Yeah. Well, you remember uh, last, what was it, last month, month before last, I had an infection on, on the back of my hand. Yeah. It was remember in August. That? Yeah. Yeah. It was in August. It was nasty. It was like some sort of weird topical infection that just showed up one day. And I went to my doctor and I said, I got this. And he looked at it and he said, yeah, you got that. Here, take these drugs, use them this way. And I took the drugs and I used them that way. And the infection went away. I don't have it anymore. I was healed through the good offices of my physician and his chemicals. And you're sticking to Okay. Yeah, am I following his his instructions? Yeah. If if I had gotten the prescriptions and then not used them and then complained because the infection was still there eating its way through my hand, um, whose fault would would that be? Mm -hmm. Or if I did things to reinfect the wound over and over again, whose fault would that be? Yeah. This is going to piss a bunch of people off. It just really is. This is this is not a popular topic. No, it's not. Yeah. So, um, I think people do this not only, you know, as you describe with like physical stuff. That's almost a metaphor for what people sometimes do with emotional and psychological oh, stuff. Oh, even even more so. Mm -hmm. Um, I have seen people work on traumas and then literally reinfect themselves the moment they're done doing the work. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think we, we may have all seen that, but it feels weird to describe it in that way, even though that is essentially exactly what's happening. Yep. So what might that look like in practice? Um, somebody has a trauma they go to some healer or another a shaman whatever uh, they go through whatever process of healing that person does at the end of it they they go oh i'm healed and then they walk out of there and then they re-pull up the trauma again and they relive it and they relive it until they reinstall it mm -hmm. Sometimes these therapists will do this for them. Yeah. Which is kind of what was on my mind today in that we kind of have this culture in which there is this constant kind of reification of trauma in discourse generally, especially in communities that are really vulnerable to trauma and to re-traumatization. And it's sad because it's such a struggle, not only for them, but for them to often unconsciously be strengthening that traumatization. It's, it's, it's a lot. It feels very heavy. Yeah. One wonders if one cannot become, um, addicted to the process of healing 
Mm. Yeah. Because it's not only possible to be addicted to the suffering itself, but also to the remedy or the the hope of remedy. Yeah. And the process of seeking it out and, and working on it and all of that. So it becomes quite cyclical. And then there is the part where you find uh, either ignorant or unscrupulous people who keep you in that state of trauma because mm -hmm. they make money off of you. We used to, when I was, I was uh, working in uh, mental health, we would laugh at uh, people who had gone to Freudian therapy for 20 years sometimes. And the best that they could hope to be was a well-adjusted neurotic. Think about that, 20 years of therapy and the best you can hope for is being a well-adjusted neurotic. And we see that in in mental health, you know, in mental health, everything revolves around the diagnostic and statistical manual mm -hmm. because that's how you get paid. And there is nothing in that manual for a healthy person. You, you cannot go, this person is healthy. Here's the axes that show that they're healthy. Anytime somebody comes to you and sits across from you as a therapist, you have to look at the DSM-5 or whatever number it is these days, I think I've lost count, and find their pathology. If you want insurance coverage, you better do that. Yeah. yeah. So whoever is sitting across from you, by definition, has a pathology. So if you want to never have a, a mental health diagnosis saying that you're like a, a manic depressive or, you know, whatever, don't go and see a mental health professional because they have to give you one if they want to get paid. Granted, I did have a pretty, pretty amazing therapist my last go around. Um, we worked together for, I think, four and a half years. And whatever she had to put on paper in order for us to work together and have my insurance cover it, we did not discuss that. We did not create a relationship in an environment between us where we were fixated on diagnoses and terminologies around illness and so forth. So yeah, she's pretty damn exceptional. Yeah, she is. And she is trying to work within a system that she actually finds quite stifling and at times, you know, not for everyone, but at times dangerous for some people. So there you are. And I don't know if any of you have seen this, uh, healing groups, groups of people who work on healing themselves. And you go there and you look at the people, you come back a year later, the same people are still there working on the same problems. You go back a year after that, same people, same problems. 20 years later, they're still working on their problems. They ain't healed yet. My sense of all of this is that healing should not take your whole life. You should not die having not healed from your traumas. I mean, does that seem unreasonable? Shuri, I see you nodding. I really, really believe that because I've had a lot of things happen, but it's also having good people tell me don't don't live your life through the wounds that you've been experienced i think that's where people keep reliving the same trauma 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 unless it's actually um you know using it as a teaching thing or something like that i think when we keep reliving it over and over we don't let ourselves heal. 
and that's no, no good. And, and you're not focusing your energies. It takes a lot of, actually, backtrack, it takes a lot of energy to serve a wound. I like the way you said that. And that energy should be redirected into forward thinking so that, you know, even their present will be dragged out of the mud and you can actually be that lotus flower and actually grow something really good and, and be able to function as a normal human being. Um, particularly after the nasty experience that I had and I went to something what we call here is the rape crisis center mm -hmm. and I was amazed at all these dark women who were trying to turn me into a person who hated men and I thought no, that, that's not what I want that's not what I'm looking for I, I want to be able to stop hurting so that I can have a, a relationship with someone maybe get married in the future or whatever it's all of those things that are, are good and proper for me, for me, maybe not for someone else, but I didn't want to be stuck in the wounded place. And I was just adamant about that. I thought, I don't like this. I don't like the way this feels. So it's, it is um, maybe the blessing that I had been given a certain awareness about that, that nope, don't take that on. We have to continually have good teachers in your life i mean this is a new thing for me for the last few years working with new people and you bring my attention to things i can work on and that's wonderful but yeah it's i tell people even with physical pain i said it takes a lot of energy to manage chronic pain and that even the emotional psychic pain is just so draining it takes the vitality out of all your relationships with your children, with your partner, with your friends, with your family. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Thanks, Sheree. And, you know, I do think there are ways in which, you know, we, we tend to focus on developmental trauma as being particularly unresolvable. So there's that. And again, we, we mentioned integrating it in ways that allow us to find the, the fertile seeds that help us move forward. But traumas can happen every day of our lives, especially when we're living under circumstances that are cumulatively challenging, you know, like being a woman in a culture that's very patriarchal, for example, the hits often keep coming. What do you do with that? How do you navigate that in a way that isn't an accumulation of traumas? And I think that's why we need to connect with a practice that allows us to <sighs> to continue to integrate, essentially. Shuri, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, I know Jayesh wants to talk as well. Oh, yeah. Ask, why, why do you say that developmental trauma is unresolvable? Why I'm not saying that, yeah. Like, but people say that to, I have friends who are still dealing with that, but I always see them looking through that childhood wound even mm. in my own family. And you think the chip on your shoulder that you've nurtured and fostered till it's, you know, this huge thing, um, when you can really look back as an adult, and this is from Mushtaq and I talking about, when you're an adult, you can say, well, at that time, under those circumstances, those people made decisions that they thought was the best thing that they could do at that time. They might do it differently now. And sometimes circumstances make it really difficult to do certain things. But now that you're an adult, you don't have to go back there. And you don't have to hang out with those people if they're not nice people or they're, you know, in cases of incest and all those kinds of things. You don't um, 
you don't have to keep company with them. You're, you're an adult. You can make decisions to choose your new family. You are my family in a way because I've chosen yeah. to keep company with you. You are my tribe, my my people. And Damn right. If, if there was something that offended me about you guys and I brought it up and no one could hear me, maybe it's time for me to move on. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Jayesh. Yeah. Thanks, Sri. Yeah, so I, I, I read a book uh, called The Presence Process by Michael Brown. And in this book, uh, he uh, explained these two concepts, like healing and uh, integration. So uh, healing is like we are addressing the symptoms. And integration, we are addressing the cause. I like that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, healing, uh, if there is any trauma, the most of us or most of the healers are trying to address the effect of the trauma. And integration deals with the deeper aspect of this trauma. And once, if it is not rightly integrated, then healing can go on and on till the life ends. So, uh, and ultimately all boils down to this uh, self-integration via self-observation and self-remembering. Uh, <laughs> Good connection, yeah. Thanks, Jayesh. I think that's a really, um, really good way to think about it, actually. Yeah. Um, often the way I think about it is, let's say you've had a broken bone. You break your arm. Uh, the doctor puts you in a cast, maybe gives you some steroids to reduce the, the inflammation around the break. And six weeks, eight weeks later, the bone has fused back together. It's healed. But you take the cast off and you go, oh my God, I can't move my arm. And then you go through the process of working the muscles in your arms that have kind of been stuck where they were and getting your uh, range of motion back and rebuilding the strength from an arm that hasn't been used in eight weeks, that's not healing. Again, that may be the integration. That, that may be something um, quite a bit different than healing and it's generative rather than remedial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you look like you have had a deep thought. Well, I'm thinking about how so often people come together in groups to process their pain, you know? Yes. And in a lot of cases, what happens is people are trying to heal that pain and they are sharing their symptoms and commiserating over it. You know, we're talking emotional, psychological pain, most likely in this case. And yet there's such a culture that builds up around that experience, that shared experience. Um, I think there's a word for it. It's called trauma bonding. So everyone bonds through the trauma to the point where it's difficult to go beyond healing to integration because there's a risk of losing the community in the process. And even though there's the opportunity to create community based on integration there, it feels like such a huge leap. And it's it feels like scary. such a risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, um, who am I without my trauma? Mm -hmm. You know, because it could very well be that your trauma has helped you create your identity. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I so, feel like uh, I've seen a lot of that. Sometimes people uh, use it uh, as a case of self-pity and they seek attention of yeah. people 
so it, it uh, and they feel good about it so they they get identified with the trauma or illness and they they want to continue so that people uh, give their attention and that's how they go on yeah i i do think that's how people gain power within these groups is they start building up an identity around that suffering and they build up their power within their community based on magnifying that suffering and frankly it creates a pretty toxic environment yeah so the question for us is how do you know when you're healed how would you know if you if you have had this trauma that you've been carrying around and reliving every day of your life how do you know when you're healed Probably one sign would be you'd stop reliving it. And if that's a sign of being healed, going to some place that asks you to relive it over and over again may be contraindicated. Just saying, just it's a hypothesis on my part. I've learned that it's the lens you look at the world through. So if you're using that trauma lens to see the world, so if I looked at that, I would look at every man as a dangerous person and I wouldn't go there. And I thought, I don't want to do that. And, and I had a great um, counsellor who said to me, she said, when you're looking through that all the time, everything's tainted, everything's stained and I, I really love, I could understand that she said make it like a picture put it on the wall behind you and make that picture really small it becomes smaller and smaller the more the further away you move away from it it didn't it's not saying it didn't happen it happened but it's now not the biggest focus of you in front of you so it's this tiny picture behind you because it's in your past you've dealt with it you're done so what are you looking at the world through now you know so that I feel like it's taking self-responsibility. I'm responsible for me. It's not up to you to make me happy and it's not up to um, my ego to make up the story. Who's the real me? Put the real me out, one face, one face all the time. We, um, I've been talking about that with some friends of mine that sometimes you have a face like, I'm gonna be mother, I'm gonna be wife, I'm gonna be this and that. You know what, how, how about we just have one face? One face, this is me, this is Cherie, this is how I am, take me. If, if you don't like it, oh well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it's, you know, what you think of me, that thing, what you think of me doesn't, doesn't bother me too much anymore. You know, sometimes I might go, ooh, I should be a bit more sensitive. <laughs> Another time to me, this is me, this is what I enjoy doing. If you wanna be with me, great. If you don't, great. You have, you're entitled to your opinion. I don't have to agree with you. That's okay. I have a stronger sense of me. And this is my one face, this is what you got. I like this face, Sheree. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right. I'm not sure who unmuted first. Do you guys know? Oh, well, then I'll just go ahead right. and steal okay. the limelight. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to give a personal example. What, sure. what happened to me was I ended up going, this was about 10 years ago, a physical burnout. Mm. And I ended up in, in quite a psychological mess. And I felt very like a, alone. I was the only person in, who'd been through this. I would have loved to have found a group I could join and, and share so I could have someone else to share my suffering with. Not only did I never find a group, I never found even one person who had gone through this, which I, I'm sure there's many people that have. There was there's nothing unusual in this. But anyway, I, I, I had to face this problem without that um, that in, indulgence of being part of a group myself. 
and uh, I had to find the cause of why I ended up burning out in, in and I really had to um, go through what, what I consider a, a genuine healing and to me what was the sign that I have been and have made a genuine healing is I've had to understand how to regulate my energy, my physical energy, which I feel I have now. I, I, I'll never make that mistake again. Yeah, that sounds like you have healed from that trauma. And at this point, I think reliving it over and over again would probably not serve you. No, just on occasion, I, I say to my, I, I indulge a little bit in how bad it felt. Just, just to say, Jonathan, don't make the same mistake again. Just regulate your energy and stay on the, the, the straight path. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Just a taste of it. You're not fully going there. Yeah. All right. To remind me. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing, Jonathan. I'm glad that, uh, you know, you haven't had any recurring situations of that. No. Good. Levita. Um. I never know what to expect when I come to these things, even though I know the topic. Mm. <laughs> that's okay, um, neither do we. <laughs> well, that's a comfort. Um, I would say from my personal experience that when you can talk about what happened and you're not emotionally reliving it as you talk about it, and you can talk about it without shame or anger, um, and you've learned the lesson. Um, not to say that it was your fault or anything, but sometimes we need to learn red flags, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, when I actually had that happen where something happened and I, I felt the feelings and, and did what I needed to do. And one day somebody could say something to me and I could go, oh yeah, that happened to me once. And this is what I did. And I sound like this. I don't sound like I'm still angry. I'm not crying about it. Um, that tells me that it's processed fully. It's totally integrated in terms of, yeah, if I see that red flag again, I'm going to be like, <laughs> okay, red flag. Yeah. And I don't wait. I don't wait for the rest of the parade to show up. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, I find that relatable. I remember trying to share an experience that I felt really was important to a friendship to share, you know, about a trauma. And as I was trying to share it with my friend, all of the stuff came up and I was like, okay, this is a sign that maybe right now is not the time for me to go there, you know, and I'll just put it in my back pocket and talk about it at a different time when I feel more that the, that it, the experience is more integrated and my friend understood she didn't want me to have to relive it in that moment she clearly knew something was wrong and she was able to hold space for me without knowing all the details and that was exactly what I needed and since then I have been able to integrate it as a result yeah yep But yeah, I, I do think that you're right there. You're right when you say that sometimes it is a matter of just knowing, okay, you know, I have come to a place where this doesn't feel as threatening now and that's a good sign, yeah. Um, something else I've encountered when it comes to this sort of thing is- yeah when I've been through stuff, sometimes I didn't need anybody to fix it because I've already done what I can do. Sometimes right. you're in a bad situation and all you can do is gut it out. You've got to go through what you got to go through. And sometimes 
you just want to acknowledge that you're not crazy. This, this <laughs> is a terrible thing you're going through. You know, like, yeah. yes, the reason it feels really terrible is because it's a terrible thing you're going through and it's difficult. And yes, I have every faith and confidence that you will get through it. And, but the dangerous thing is, and I have to admit to my shame that I've been guilty of this too, where people are like, they want you to tell them and then they want you to keep reliving it when mm -hmm. you're not really in a place where you can relive it, where it doesn't just turn into a tsunami of pain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and I've been on the receiving end of that where, oh, tell us what's wrong. Tell us what's tell, we can, tell us what's wrong. And then when you finally like, okay, here it is. Then it's like, oh my God. Why did you tell me all of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> the worst. Yeah, I didn't need to hear all of that, and and I had other things to do, and my whole day is ruined. And you're like, you like in your head, you're rewinding. Didn't you say you wanted me? But so yeah, yeah, and, that's and hard. It, yeah, and people keep it trying to keep you in that trauma like you are the person that that thing happened to forever when you've moved past it mm -hmm. so that can be kind of but i really liked what jash said about healing versus integration mm -hmm. i love that i've got that written down i've got a card of stuff like that and i'm going to add it to it because that's, that's very, very helpful. Very helpful. You're, you're costing my therapist money, man. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I mean, in a loving way, that's kind of the point, right? Yeah. Well, you know, my therapist is a hardworking person. She earns yeah. every penny. I hope she doesn't raise her rates. Um, <laughs> but I'm also like, as much as I like her, and I actually like her, I wish I had never met her as a therapist because she seems oh, really cool as a person. Mm -hmm. But I really, I would be, if I could just get past some of these things and just never see her again in her professional capacity, that would be awesome. So, you know, so, and that thing about repair versus education is like, really? Yeah. Yeah, I'm flying. I'm flying out your way. I'm moving in. Never leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon as we get the monastery built, we will have a cell for you. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm kind a of monk cell. You, said, you didn't say room. You said cell. <laughs> <laughs> it's a traditional term. Yeah, we don't literally yeah. mean like there's bars and you're gonna get a bull shoved under no. the door. You know, it'll be yeah, nice. No, a monk that. cell. That, that, yeah. that, that's what that's what you're saying because I'm over here. But, <laughs> uh -huh. It's like, oh, this is a really nice clang. No, well, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Ah. You can spruce it up however you like. Yeah. <laughs> as long as as long as I don't see any jackets that button in the back. Ooh, no. Ooh, no. <laughs> no. We would be the ones wearing them, not you. So <laughs> oh, yeah. man. not a good idea anyway. Have you ever asked yourself what is it like to put somebody in a straight Ooh. jacket? I, I, I can't how do I put this? I have too much trouble identifying with other people's emotions to even think about doing such a thing. <laughs> it makes me really feel anxious to even watch magicians do it. Mm. Yeah. You know, the straitjacket is a, a violent piece of hardware. Yeah. You do not get a resistant person into a straitjacket without violence. Trust me, I know this. Yeah, First unless hand. you drug I, them, I, which is violent too. Right, yeah, exactly. And if you drug them, they don't need the straitjacket. True. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, mm. yeah. Yeah. No, I started in mental health just as they were phasing those out finally. And it was like, who thought of this? Who thought this was a good idea? Because it wasn't. It's pretty fucked up. It's It's beyond fucked up. It's... 
it's stupid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because when you, when you, when you, and I, oh, my only experience with these places is what I see on TV. And so it's like, everything I've seen is, okay, you, people are put in it and they're upset and they're being told that they have to calm down. If they don't calm down, they'll be drugged forcibly or whatever. If they don't want to eat, they'll be forced to eat. I don't know if it's true. This is what I've seen. But I gotta say, to that me, would not make me calm down. Like, <laughs> Yeah, nobody in the history of the world has ever calmed down by people telling them to calm down. Nobody. <laughs> um, but I, I was I was thinking about it, and I'm like, but the natural human reaction to being caged is rage. Yeah. So if a person is perfectly content to be locked in a cell with no way out, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> there's something wrong. Or even just mo- locked in a building. Yeah, there's, there's something yeah, because wrong. Because in, in fact, people in psychiatric wards are not locked in cells as a rule. They, they have an entire locked ward. So you got yeah. the day room, you got the dining hall, you got all of that. And then there's a door that you can't get out of. And that's enough to piss people off. Yeah, because we're like built to roam and do what we want to do. So, yeah. I mean... You look at all yeah, these people. Though there who not are everybody is pissed off about being in that situation. Some people find it safe, interestingly enough. Yeah, but I would think those would be people who were going through things where they were never safe, no matter where they were. So finally finding Could a very place well where they are safe. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you think you you look at people in the world today who are losing their ish because they're told you can't go here unless you're vaccinated or you're wearing a mask. And I'm not talking about the, I don't want to do it, but will, but the people who actually flip out and start throwing things and, and you're going, nobody's stopping you from going someplace else, <laughs> but. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like so. yeah. Shuri, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, because I'm um, going back to uh, a skillful means that was given to me by Lawrence was if I was talking about something that was upsetting me, if I started speaking about it more than once, he would stop me. Don't repeat the story. He just stop it. Don't repeat it. Okay, now what do I talk about? And that was a really helpful skill to stop repeating the trauma, stop repeating the story. I can listen to you once and I will be empathetic, supportive, all of those things and make suggestions. But if you repeat it to me again, I'm going to stop you. And I've done that to some people and they were so shocked and almost wounded and hurt. And I didn't hear from them for quite a while, but they got over it. And it was more helpful for me to do that instead of continually nurturing that wound for them by being this sympathetic ear. And um, for me, not to repeat my story with details and so forth, that has been powerful because that helped me heal. So that's what I just wanted to say. Don't repeat Yeah, I think that dovetails nicely with what Levita was sharing earlier about, you know, sharing with someone and then the repercussions of that potentially, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, we we re-traumatize each other. Let's say we have a shared experience. We re-traumatize each other when we discuss the same things over and over again with all the details and all the painful nuance. And it's a lot. It, it's a lot to, to hold that both as the person sharing and as the person listening. And it's it's a reliving and we have to question whether that's necessary or not. So taking this point further that uh, not to repeat the story. So uh, by repeating story, we uh, give it more strength, but, and that is the mental aspect of things. But then uh, what that Michael Brown suggested that we have to let go the mental aspect and we have to dive deep into the uh, felt aspect of the things. But if I am having some trauma within my body or my mind, I have to be with that trauma and trying to experience that uh, felt aspect 
totally and in that way i am out of my mind and uh, then we are touching at the vibrational aspect of that thing and by our attention uh, and unconditional attention uh, it may get integrated within our system and then it goes away I think sometimes that does work. I don't know if that always works, but I do think that yeah. can be an important piece. Yeah. It cannot work like the broken bones. Mm. It has to be healed by a physician or doctor and then physiotherapist. But then there are certain uh, emotional traumas and all that. So we have to find it with the, uh, the cause of it. And then we have to be with that cause or we have to be with that feeling inside our body because any trauma has certain feeling inside my body part or within my cell and if i can be with that cell and energy then it uh, gets healed. it gets integrated rather than healed instead of pushing it away is yeah, what you mean yeah yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah i do think there is a place for that yes and and sometimes it takes time to be able to do that right because as with sharing a story with someone else sometimes it can be too much for us to go there So we let it cool down and then we can have that experience in a more grounded way that isn't just going to hit us like a tsunami where we just completely lose that ability to be present with the experience. Is is that something like when you get a scrape as a kid and it scabs over and when we're young, you're like, you want to get rid of it and you keep picking at it. And when you pick at it, it starts to bleed again <laughs> versus if you just leave it alone long enough, one day you look and it's just fallen off on its own. Is it something like that? Sort of. I mean, there are some things that if, if you know, I don't mean this as, as tersely as it sounds like if you ignore it, it'll go away. Like there are some things that are in fact like that. And then there are other things that are not, and they kind of keep coming back to haunt mm. us a little bit. So at if some point- If the scab gets infected, yeah. you need some something to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, cause some of the stuff that you go through day to day can be traumatic, but you go home and you know, you throw something at the wall, you don't kick the cat, you know, that kind of thing you let it out, you exercise or yell or, you know, hit a pillow or something. And by the next day, you're like, yesterday wasn't perfect, but it's over. Mm -hmm. And then other stuff is, I guess, yeah, infected. Mm -hmm. I don't know the word for when it happens to your emotions, but it's infected and you might need more help to process and integrate. Yep. But, you know, like, if I have to, if you have, if you said, oh, give me a trauma that happened recently, it's like, <laughs> the guy who delivered my thing, put it in the wrong spot, you know. Damn you, delivery man. <laughs> um. You know, it, it's, it's a minor irritation and it came and it went and, you know, but I didn't sit there and go, dang it, every time they come, they do this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's another, that's another thing, like verbal hygiene can come into play. And we've talked about this in past talks where sometimes we go to, you know, conceptual extremes where we're like, this always happens, or nobody ever does this for me, things like that. And then that, as Sheree was saying, becomes the lens through which you encounter those experiences, and they make it makes them so much worse than they may actually be. So, we get to the end of this, which is some questions. How do you know something needs to be healed? If it needs to be healed, how do you know when it's healed? After it's healed, what do you do? These are important questions because the last thing anybody needs is to be caught in an infinite loop of um, healing a trauma. All that does is enrich a con man. So how do you know what needs to be healed? How do you know when it's healed? 
what does what needs to happen in order to heal it and what do you do after it's healed so for those of you who are listening to this on youtube answer down below i'm really interested in what you think for you guys uh put something up on uh on the forum and we can keep this discussion going yeah but right now we need to wrap this talk up it's that time we're being good we kept it an hour <laughs> yes ish <laughs> yeah so um is it okay if we touch base with uh, a couple of people, or should we just sign off? No, if they want, if they want yeah. their bases touched, I you just... know. <laughs> <laughs> Consensually, of course. Um, Mr. Keem, what's what's coming up for you? You don't want to talk? Okay, that's fine. What about you, Nancy? Um, I don't know. Weird coincidence. I was just seeing some of Peter Levine stuff, mm. where he says that. Animals sometimes need to heal from trauma. And what they do is they go off and they shake and they breathe deeply and they're fine. Yeah, and it's true. As far as we know. As far as we know, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm not super familiar with Peter Levine's stuff. I feel like that's a whole scene that I tend not to, a whole like, you know, marketplace scene that I don't necessarily engage with, but for some people it's proven helpful. I just, I think sometimes it's good to get away from the vocabulary of trauma and of healing and to just encounter experiences on their own terms and mm. apply some of the principles we're talking about here, of course, but without necessarily framing them in such a way. Because sometimes that adds to the the heaviness of it is to put those labels on it. That makes sense. Yeah. I know that I have experienced that firsthand. So I'm trying to speak from a place of having been there. All right. So, Shuri, yeah. What's up? Well, Mushtaq said to me one day that the suffering feels real, but the story isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. once you, you realize, you think, yeah, the story, I'm generating the story in my own mind. And my Tibetan friend, Geshe-la, always used to just say to us, not even real. Not. And so we use mm -hmm. that as a, as a joke. And I've used this in other talks before that. Sometimes when you can catch yourself and you go, not even real. <laughs> and laugh. You've got to laugh. You think, I'm just creating yeah. that. And, but the suffering does feel real. And mm -hmm. so when you recognize, okay, it feels real, but is it real? Then you're on your way to healing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Shree. Stop whinging. That's a good one. Yeah, you're a champion whinger. <laughs> That's also it's very Australian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go to Brady Bunch mode. All right. And we are in Brady Bunch mode. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for uh, joining us for this, you know, this kind of hot button topic that I think can be really, you know, it's, it can be touchy for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. So thank you so much for your patience being here, your bravery, participating, all of that stuff. We really appreciate it consider answering Mushtaq's questions because I think that could be fun. And we'll see you next time. All right. All right. Everybody Take wait. care. Bye. Bye.